and welcome to the Evil Sheep cast. I'm, I'm Celine. And I'm Stephen. This is the first of our podcasts, but we're going to do them every week. But if you want to know when we're going to do it and you need to subscribe and hit the bell because we're not sure yet so you need to do that Um, and whatever way you listen on just the audio side make sure you subscribe as well so what we're going to talk about today then um dialectics today um, which i think you need to make sound more exciting (laughs) right okay so um so this is this is a subject that we've kind of both come across in our um sort of studies um and we thought it would be quite kind of relevant to talk about because obviously it has a big part to play in, in films um so where do we start um first i think just a general description of what it is would be useful because i don't think most people know what dialectics are to be honest okay do you want me to do that then mm-hmm. so um so obviously i'm not a philosopher um and uh, my my specialism is in psych- psychology, but um, we we did do a little bit about this, and I've done a bit of research before this, so um, I've just put that caveat in front in case somebody says, "Oh, I've said something wrong." Um, I'm quite happy to be put right, but from my understanding of of what dialectics are from a kind of philosophical point of view, we go back to Hegel. Um, so I've I've used this book, which is the most used book in our house. Um, and that's not because we are, uh, you know, philosophy, philosophy, philosophy buffs. Mm. It's because it's a good size to lean on. Um, so it perfectly fits an A4 piece of paper, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. So it was nice to be able to get the book out to talk uh, or to use it in a way that it's actually designed. Um, so there is a, a section on Hegel, who is the, the guy really when it comes to um, dialectics. It's his thing, isn't it? It's his thing. He made it. Indeed. Um, so you described it as his theory... Of everything. Of everything. Just because everything can be encapsulated. I think it says it somewhere around okay. here. Everything can be encapsulated into his theory. Where is it? Um, no phenomenon escapes the dialectic. Wherever there is movement, wherever there is life, wherever there is anything in, um, in carried into effect the actual world the dialectic is at work so basically i think you said like oh anything if you explain what of the thesis synthesis thing. yeah okay so the idea well first of all the idea is that his view is that the world isn't made up of separate isolated things um you can only understand facts you can only understand the world if you think about it in terms of uh relationships between things mm. um so that kind of cuts across a little bit our scientific way of trying to understand the world because we tend in science we tend to try and isolate a very specific thing and try to understand everything about that and then we try to understand everything about something else um but uh, dialectics is first of all comes from the position that says that actually you can't understand things from an individual you kind of have to you have to look at it in the round, I suppose, this mm-hmm. gestalt. Um, so that's, I suppose that's the first thing. Obviously, if we think about dialectic, there's something around dialogue there. Mm-hmm. And so his idea was that there were opposing dialogues and that these are from these opposing dialogues, in, in other words, opposites. Mm. And from these opposing dialogues, these opposites, comes some truth some some rational fact Mm. so light and dark good and evil Mm. those sorts of things and and together in opposition they bring forth something that Mm -hmm. is um is true i definitely think it's interesting i don't think that we think in that way anymore Mm. um because we don't we're moving away from binary thinking because it works in a very binary system like you said like light and dark good and bad men and female but we don't really we've sort of moved away from that well i suppose so but i think hegel in a way is trying to say you know you you, you can think about these these binaries but until you 
bring them together into some sort of unity then then you can't really understand any of it Mm. um so we he talks about um a thesis so you might say that you know um this this object is beautiful um, which could be a thesis Um, you could say this object is ugly Mm -hmm. and that would be the antithesis of Mm -hmm. that the opposite of that but through dialogue through Mm -hmm. discussion you come to a kind of middle ground, if you like, where you really understand that object now in all its mm-hmm. in all its depth. Mm-hmm. So you'll never understand it if you only think it's beautiful. You'll never really understand it if you only think it's ugly. You can only really understand it if yeah. you discuss all of that and you come together. And it's this bringing together of these two opposing views mm-hmm. that that helps you to to see the rational world. It's that's the only way you can get understanding. Mm. that's my that's my understanding of dialectics mm-hmm. um it's kind of been taken on a bit further there's a really interesting paper that i would recommend um i think you can i think this is available through google scholar without any sort of specific access um it's worth looking at we'll put the description or we'll put the quotes in the description it's called a tale of two voices relational dialectics theory by leslie a baxter um, and she, it's interesting because she starts with quoting from Charles Dickens mm. the um, uh, tale of two cities it was the best of times it was the worst of times it was the age of wisdom it was the age of foolishness it was the epoch of belief it was the epoch of incredulity and mm. so on so she's kind of using this idea of these two um, different opposing views and, uh, and obviously then using it to make sense of what's happening in reality, if you like, mm. um, she also talks about this this Russian um, uh, philosopher called Bakhtin, who looks at this, takes it on further, I suppose, further than Hegel did. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk about that? And um, yeah, well, I mean, I read the uh, essay as well. So obviously, she discusses um, the fact that. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say when I when I when I say that we don't think in a Hegelian way of like there's just two opposites anymore. Um, she's talking about the state of flux and the fact that you don't just get a synthesis of two things that it's pushing and pulling. Um, yeah, she, she uses, uses centrifugal. She does. And centripetal. Centri- yeah. Yeah. Well, she uses both. So pushing yeah. in force and expanding out force mm. um, and she discusses yeah that that's more she thinks that's more um relevant way of thinking about it now which i think is just basically it's just a way of still using the theory in the way you described it but in more more in time with the way that we talk which is less binary so mm. it's more of a instead of having yeah it is more conversational than the the binary opposites i suppose it's not just about opposites oh. yeah it's this mixture this flux as mm. you say um this idea that through this conversation through this um disagreement through this dynamic interchange of ideas and so on you you can um you, mm-hmm. you can come to this moment she calls aesthetics yeah which is this moment where um, you have a, a kind of complementarity between mm. these two things. Um, so at this point, and this is a fleeting moment, it's at this point where um, you get this this harmony, if you like. Mm. And it doesn't. So it doesn't last forever. It, it then goes back into mm. these oppositional forces, but it's at that moment that you truly understand something. I think is what she's what yeah. she's saying. I think it's interesting because last night I was talking to my friends online because obviously we don't see each other in person anymore. Mm. and um i was saying and, that, and i think this all the time anyway but i think the reason i particularly kind of even though it's kind of difficult to understand dialectics i think because of the jargon and language used and it's not it is a philosophical debate so it's not necessarily easy and it doesn't come up in general conversation but the reason i do like it as far as i can understand it is that that idea yeah of of um you have to listen to the other side in order to understand something truly 
because I think in a time when no one listens to each mm. other and also in a time where you're discouraged from forming friendships or relationships with people outside your group mm. um, it's just I, I like a theory like this because for instance me and my partner um don't always agree on the same things politically Mm. or we come to maybe the same conclusion but in very different ways so our conclusion is both that we're looking to do something that will improve you know this particular part of society and that's why education but we vote but we vote differently it's not because you do do you know i mean that isn't it's nice to be able to have that conversation and understand and um like as I think Zoe said, she was like, "No one gets convinced by calling someone else a dick." <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and it, it, but even if you never even see each other to even call the other one a dick, do you know what I mean? Because you're so separated. So I, I yeah. like that this is a theory that encourages talking to the other side. Yeah, and it's a bit it, off piece, but well, it's I, I think it's quite interesting because in some respects it, it it says you know to understand the world you have to have these opposing ideas. So. You know, you can't really understand happiness until you know sadness. Mm. You can't really know um, pleasure unless you've experienced pain. I suppose these are logical Mm -hmm. things that we we perhaps don't think about. But it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, your point is well made about the tribal aspects of our politics and so on. Um, But this suggests that you you can't know justice unless you know injustice. Mm. Um, and the thought occurred to me, I think I mentioned this to you the other day, that in a way, with some of the behaviour of people around this mm. current situation, um, you think, how can people be denying facts? But in a way, if dialectics is a good way of explaining the world, then you should expect that there will be people denying facts. You know, mm. So you can't understand what's true unless there's somebody there trying to tell you what's not true or you know and that's uh, that's kind of really interesting and we're seeing that played out at the moment with people saying you know i don't care um i'm going to go out and do what i want and regardless of what the risks are to me and i I deny the science and so on and so on Mm -hmm. so yeah interesting um so do you think we've done enough there in terms of of talking about the philosophy of it i mean it's obviously um marx takes up this idea of dialectics as well Uh, i suppose the only thing i I can say about marx um is that he so from hegel's perspective it's it's a it's a kind of academic exercise it's a logical exercise of saying well you know an individual who is rational can look at this and can look at this um and two individuals let's say or two dialogues can find some truth if you like within those those extremes Mm. whereas Marx says that in a way that's very difficult because of your of the power structures inherent in the society Mm. which means that you only have access to certain understandings if you like yeah because of the of the power differentials within society Mm. um so for him it's a much more active theory this praxis this theory and practice if you like mm-hmm. where you know it's required to kind of do something mm-hmm. about these inequalities yeah i mean i think obviously marx is coming from a very different time <laughs> yeah so obviously, hopefully i mean i think there's still a lot a lot of work to do in our education system but people are i think I think, di- I think dialectics is a difficult theory to understand in terms of like if you going into the theory, the theory of it and reading it in a philosophical textbook and reading this essay I don't think you could just hand that off to anyone because obviously yes yeah, some people are provided with more education than others and are able to you know like Marx is saying there's inherent power structures of who can and can't get access to those materials but I think in terms of practice you don't really need to understand dialectics to be practicing dialectics you just Mm. need to be encouraged to consider the other point of view you know like when you're a child and it's like well put yourself in their shoes Mm -hmm. do you know what i mean it's kind of Mm. like but we just don't 
maybe we just don't do that enough because obviously there's a curriculum at school so they're just trying to teach you what is right in the curriculum but maybe in order to create more well-rounded open-minded and and kind people you also need to do a bit more of dialectical learning when Mm. you consider you you present them with two sets of information and then you help them to come to a conclusion in the middle yeah i I think the thing is that the taken for granted elements of it and without getting into too deep on the um sort of critical um scholarly efforts um, there's a lot of critical thinking around, let's say, um, uh, the ability for us to understand what it's like to be um, a person um, from a different ethnic yeah. group yeah. or um, a different gender. And and obviously there's a lot of talk about um, certain groups of society having more power than others, mm. but it's not necessarily recognised because from that their position because they don't there's so many taken for granted that they don't sort of see it and that's mm-hmm. so yeah your point about education i think is well made because that's i guess the only way you can start to reveal some of those take yeah. for, taken for granted things yeah i feel like this is something that would be good to be taught in like pshe because mm. you know like personal development or pd whatever your school called it but um these are sort of things you could do in in PD where it's like yeah you your personal development is how to understand other people mm. and I think like I mean we were talking a bit about this last night until way past midnight what you and your, your friends on yeah. your virtual pub meetup virtual pub meetup yeah, yeah. Um, we we're just talking about how the core subjects like maths English and science are yeah treated like these really you know as this like golden trio mm. but then other things get forgotten that are quite important like like we're all really and i was part of it i was really snidey about pshe at school and personal development and citizenship whatever they called it it had different names all the mm. time but it was like because we we're like it was a waste of time we should be doing other things but then if you think about it if it was te- and the, but the way they do it is a waste of time currently they're just because it's we, we did debate but if you did a debate in more of a dialectical way where you were tr- you were the point was to come to an understanding but debate was to win mm. <laughs> so at school we just learned how to win <laughs> an argument but isn't that how politics works anyway i mean that that doesn't necessarily mean that dialectics is is wrong it's just that that's the mechanism no but that's what i'm saying like if we did more of a dialectical way of thinking where it wasn't the aim wasn't to win it was to understand because if dialectics at the heart of it is how to understand things and realities and all of that, then it's not about winning the argument mm. because neither of you actually have the answer on your own. So neither mm. of you could win on your own. It's about yeah. what you get in the middle. So no one wins or loses. You just have to accept that you need each other yeah. to come to a conclusion. But at school we just did who can win the debate on capital punishment. Mm. should we kill people in prison or not <laughs> and you know we didn't everyone just like it It was a bit of fun because everyone's you know like arguing and having and there's benefit to arguing your point but I do think yeah you could have a bit more kindness for a more dialectical debate rather than just winning so let's shall we move on to the, the film side of it now? yeah if we talk about the film because I could talk about the about the education system for a long yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, because obviously this is your area of mm. expertise, so so tell me about dialectics in, in the movies. The thing is, I think, I think in films it's a lot, or at least in... I don't, I'm going to make a statement and people might disagree. I feel like in films it's a lot more um, of an equation <laughs> than and a, a lot more Hegelian in, uh, because it is this kind of thesis, antithesis... Um, synthesis equation I feel like mm. where it's like image one image two meaning is is because of the way that so what does that just explain what you mean by that image one image two meaning so when you watch strike by Eisenstein um, that montage sequence because but if I go to the beginning so Eisenstein is a Russian or was a Russian filmmaker in the 1920s and further and he did a lot of Soviet filmmaking. 
um, sort of promoting the Soviet agenda and message. Though that is what people say, and that is in the literature that he was promoting it, but I don't know if it looks very promoty. Anyway, that's how he's normally written hmm. up as a Soviet filmmaker in the 1920s and onwards. Um, and he did the film Battleship Potemkin, which looks at the rise of um, Soviet power and that sort of thing. And um, he's hailed as the creator of the montage and, you know, the reason that editing looks the way it does today. So you keep using this term, the montage. Can you explain what a montage is, please? Yeah, so I mean, I think I think most people know what a montage is because... I don't know what a montage is. You don't know what a montage no. is? No. I know what a montage is on the wall where you have lots of different bits of, um, of pictures. <clears throat> okay. Or a... a um, Clipping together of different things, is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And montage is just multiple things in a sequence. So, okay. like, most films have a montage of some variety because it's just shorthand and quick way of showing a lot of things in a short amount of time. Um, so, Rocky is the one that most people... Oh, okay. You know, like, the being shit at boxing to quite good at boxing but that could take a whole film in itself watching that but you get like a really condensed right got you montage yeah. sequence. so him skipping him shadow yeah. boxing yeah and he's gradually getting better yeah. but this takes like a minute or so yeah with music in the background yeah okay. normally it's yeah it's just um obviously like so so that's a montage but most most film scholars would say that that comes from Eisenstein's right, okay. editing and his creation of the montage. So the way that he does montage is in a dialectical way. So he will do a... his. I suppose, how do we explain it? So if his thesis... I don't, I don't know how to explain it because, like, for example, in, in Strike... He is showing um, an army running into battle, and then he will cut to a cow being butchered, and like the army soldiers falling over, and then we continue back to the cows being butchered, and it's called the carnage. And we talk about you know the butchers a lot because they often refer to um, mm. uh, the enemy as the butchers and things mm. like that. And I think you know, it's this idea of, because obviously there was an uprising of Soviet power and the people's power and that Marxist theory comes in there of, you know, revolting and taking back power over those who would oppress. So the butchers are like the oppressors. Um, and I guess in an army sense here, if you're running in to battle, you're being, you're being forced to fight for someone else's war sort of thing. So he would show that through dialectics, which is, yeah, soldiers cow being butchered those that's the thesis and the antithesis but the synthesis is your you you do the synthesis in that you can understand that those aren't just images of non non consequence to each other they they connect mm. in in an equation kind of way you can know given circumstances what he's telling you mm. it's like a visual metaphor yeah so when he does that in Potemkin as well, doesn't he? he does yeah. Um, it's what he cuts to, so he will cut things that aren't necessarily to do with the story directly, hmm. um, but they inform it. Yeah, there's um, when I was watching it, um, there was a few. I, I jotted down some of these. There was a woman in white, and mm. um, dressed in beautiful white dress, mm. um, and she stood there clapping the yeah, yeah. um uh, the, the the soldiers yeah. and then and then there's a, a a man with no legs yeah obviously very poor very dirty mm-hmm. disheveled and he kind of he he walks on his stumps to um to sit right underneath her so you that the literally that is in one shot yeah. so a bit different to the um montage that you're talking about you can literally see mm-hmm. those two mm. in one shot at mm-hmm. one point which i thought was but that's yeah. That's would you say that was dialectics? I suppose yeah, it it could be if you're showing poor, wealthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Does he clap as well? I can't remember. Yeah, there's a there's a kind of it, it's quite weird because it is a Soviet film still, so. Yeah. But the um 
there's a there's a scene there where the uh, the soldiers are coming back after having mm. um, taken the ship, mm. um, and there's lots of cheering, and it seems that there's there's cheering both from the uh, bourgeoisie and the people. Yeah. So again, I obviously I don't yeah. understand this film particularly no. well, but from I what think, I understand. Yeah. I think that's the Soviet side of it, though. It's this suggestion that everyone will be happy yeah, that's now, right. that, now that everyone can be equal. That's right. Um, yeah. Obviously, we uh, saw how that went. Um, <laughs> but that's the yeah. sort of Soviet propaganda side of the film. That is that is the other thing to consider is, yeah, it's not just... Um, I think there's an article about it. It says something like, obviously, the, it's a little bit... Um, some people don't like the film, I suppose, because it's a bit because it is just a propaganda film, mm. and but but you could say just a propaganda film, but I don't. It's not that because it's had an impact on mm. so much, um, and yeah, you can read it in different ways. If you want to go death of the author, you can read it in any way you would like to. And you don't have to take into fact that it's a Soviet film made by a Soviet filmmaker. You can just watch it and make your own conclusions. So, death of the author. You'll have to explain that. Do I? Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, so Roland Barthes had the theory of the death of the author. So previous to that, all theory, we say all theory in parentheses, pretty much had to take into account the author, where they came from, what time period it's written in, why it's being written like that. Um, I mean, this is a, a reason as well that women wouldn't always would take their names off of it (laughs) because they couldn't publish it and be people would say that oh it's because they're a woman that this is like about this or whatever so you know maybe in frankenstein you would read um you would read about uh this this horrible creation and you could read into it that oh because she's a woman of that time when often women would die in childbirth or children infant mortality rate was poor and you can read it in this way and you you read her history an understanding and knowing that she apparently had many miscarriages or something so then it means that that's what this book is about whereas if you just death of the author you completely remove the author and all of their background and just take the text for what it is and what you bring to the text instead yeah. so in that case you wouldn't you wouldn't worry whether he's a soviet propagandist no. you just watch the film yeah and you you draw your own conclusions yeah. on on what yeah. you think that film means to you yeah so you don't have to say that the reason everyone's waving is because um it, because he's making a film for the for the propaganda machine it's just because everyone tr- like maybe you think well, everyone really is happy <laughs> yeah. i don't know yeah or maybe you think um maybe i don't know maybe we should find someone because there's lots of people that don't watch these films you could find someone that hasn't a clue about eisenstein and his affiliation <laughs> i mean no, I, but, I didn't know anything about him um until you asked me to to read but you to would have it. known i think a little bit, didn't you? Uh, no, I didn't. I knew nothing about Battleship mm. Potemkin or Pachumkin or. But when you were watching it, you already knew that he was a Soviet. Only, movie. only because that's what it said on the YouTube clip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, I think it's for me, it's clear where his politics lie, mm. um, because you've got these um, these dastardly baddies. Yeah. I mean, there's a one moment that I think is brilliant and it's the twirly moustache yeah, moment. Yeah. You know, you've actually got a twirly moustache. Yeah, there, it is heavy stash. <laughs> heavy stash. You've actually got a baddie going and, and I expected to hear the piano going, you know, because yeah, yeah. it's it's got that kind of feel to it. So, yeah, they, these are dastardly people, these um, these officers. Mm. The captain's evil. Yeah, his yeah. first officer's evil. Um, they're going to shoot them because they won't eat the uh, maggot-ridden, infested, infested meat. meat. Yeah. So, yeah, the, I think it's clear where mm. his sympathies lie, personally. Mm. But then I think the thing that does get me, though, is that obviously we're meant to be happy when the Cossacks come in, aren't we? Because that they're coming in to liberate the people, like the, the workers of that ship from those horrible twiddly moustache men. But then they start, like... Well, like there's a baby rolling down the steps. And it's yeah, but this is here. the this is the um, power trying to yeah. reassert itself, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So it's the people again being subjugated by yeah. by soldiers. So yeah, I, suppose, I think yeah. you know we're, we're meant to lining. to feel yeah. um, sympathy for the 
for the poor. So I noted some what I thought were these kind of opposites. So, so we've got order and disorder on the ship. Mm. Um, so there's some pictures there of like there was um, some moments where they're cleaning the uh, equipment mm. in, on the ship, and that's beautifully clean. It's 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 kept um, scrupulously clean, and then we see the the meat and the way that that's handled. Mm. Um, and I think there's a there's yeah, a difference and there. below the ship as well because it's very crowded below the ship. Yeah, when they're on the right. So upstairs, downstairs, sort of yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, but I think because ultimately a lot of it will be opposition based around. Um, see, this is why I don't think you can look at this film in *Death of the Author* because I do think it is so mm. inherently based on yeah. the time period and who was making it. Um, I think you know. A, inherently the the big opposite the big dialectic that you're looking at if this is an overarching theory of it is that you've got the have and have not Mm. and that is then broken into these smaller parts which is yeah very clean organized maggot meat and then you've got you know space and room upstairs and then you've got cramped difficult uncomfortableness absolutely yeah so all of these are constantly thrown at you poverty mm-hmm. versus luxury yeah um you know while the men are, are tr- having to eat maggoty meat mm. the soldiers have what seven spoons or something in yeah. there mm-hmm. on their table um rule maker or taker obedience disobedience mm-hmm. compliance non-compliance mm-hmm. um so i think yeah when i started look watching it, i've never seen it before but when i started watching it um obviously through the eyes that you you've given me then I started to see all these differences. Yeah. So that those are some of the um, the dialectical elements. Mm-hmm. Um, just going back to the the dialectics, according to Hegel, um, obviously if you if you end up with this synthesis mm-hmm. uh, in the middle of the thesis and the antithesis, mm-hmm. then that in itself creates its own, I suppose, dialogue. Mm-hmm. or dialogical element which then has to have um its own antithesis yeah so at the end of this film if you've come to a kind of conclusion about what's happened um through these two oppositionals mm. then that straight away means there's an answer there's a there's a a reply to that because mm. dialectics means there's always yeah this reply which is where you said about the um you know, it's kind of a theory of everything because it never stops. No, yeah, everything is caught within. Yeah, Hegel's net. I'm can sure I was pleased? Can I say a couple of things that I found interesting that might not be about dialectics from the film? Yeah, we can just talk a bit about the film. As so well. there's a couple. It's the film that everyone talks yeah. about. Yeah, so. there's a couple of things that I thought were really interesting. Um, one was um, how killed for a bowl of soup. That yeah. was like a. Um, a little statement that was that was repeated over and over again, mm-hmm. and I thought that was fascinating because that is a very kind of discursive way of understanding, or well, it's it's a way of creating a little catchphrase that has so, such power. Yeah, and actually, when you when you watch the film, that's a vast oversimplification of what happened. He wasn't really killed for a bowl of soup. Mm. He was killed because of a um, a, a mutiny yeah. on the ship, mm-hmm. and a, new, a number of factors came into that. One was the brutality of the the officers. Mm. Another was the obviously the mm-hmm. the rebellion of mm-hmm. the people on board. He wasn't killed over a bowl of soup, no. but that is such a powerful phrase, and mm. it's then used mm-hmm. to whip up interest yeah, yeah, yeah. and. Mm-hmm. And, so, and I thought that's that's very even today. I mean, this is what Twitter does, isn't it? Mm. You know, it sort of takes an issue, condenses it into something that's very powerful, and and then people hook onto that, and that becomes. Yeah, and I think that's if, if you consider him as a filmmaker and, and a storyteller, that's what his whole thing is. Because, like I said, with the montage, the power of the montage is to tell vast amounts of information in a small amount of time. Yeah, and I think killed for a bowl of soup. Yes, there is more technicality to it and like nuance, but you understand what that means yeah. in in just one sentence. And do you know what I mean? Like you can. But it's not. 
from a scientist's point of view, it's not a an accurate representation of what actually happened. No, I've seen but a it, court it has court. its own truth yeah. somehow in that statement, yeah. doesn't it? It, it encapsulates yeah. in the brutality of the situation and how someone ended up dead. Yeah. Because and and how in it encapsulates the feeling of the person mm. that died and the people that watched it happen. Yeah. And it means that you can understand where they were coming from. I yeah. Think. Yeah. It's a way of understanding the feeling. Yeah, I thought, it was, and given that it's a silent movie, mm. it was very um, the dialogue actually was really important. It's, yeah. it's very much yeah. around those kind of phrases that mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot of written um, explanation. But just that having that one but line yeah, on the screen. Yeah, very powerful. So I thought was, the other one that another one that I noticed was, and obviously we're watching a translated version yeah. of it. So I don't know if this is a real, mm-hmm. a good translation. But there is a phrase there. He's gone to feed the fishes. Yeah. So when he gets thrown off the boat and he's killed, mm-hmm. the um, one of the officers, um, there's that phrase. He's gone to feed the fishes, and that's mm-hmm. used in like lots of mafia films. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, did they get it from that? Maybe. <laughs> Uh, and the other one was the all for one and one for all. Yeah. Which, of course, I knew as as Dumas's Three Musketeers. That's mm. what they always say, um, which predates yeah. this. But I wonder if he got that phrase from from that, which I thought was yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely... Because that's kind of the original point was that it was meant to be. It's just things went wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, of course. You yeah. ended up having other people killed for bowls of soup. If, if yes, that metaphor. That extended yeah, we could talk about Animal Farm at some point, yeah. <laughs> which was another propaganda movie. Yeah, it was. Yeah, but I suppose from the we other wa- side, I'd just like to point out. Right, the book is good. The film is terrifying. What the cartoon? No, not the cartoon. The puppets, uh, man. The, the puppets. puppets. What Animal Farm puppets? Yeah, I've not seen them because they were like, but they're not very good puppets right. because obviously it's from the time before money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like in films budget. Yeah, yeah, and it's really disturbing because it's like this. We watched it in class because we it was on drop down day and we've been studying Animal Farm. So then, on the last day of term, we got to watch Animal Farm and it was horrifying because it's just these horrifying puppets and the little mouths are like. I've never seen that. Oh, and they've all the got cartoon's like good. Hairs. Yeah, I'm sure the cartoon is good. But have we not seen that? No, oh, no, we watched. Um, upsetting right. that's, puppets. That's the theme for another podcast, I think. We need to <laughs> and watch that. was actually very good. Um, so another another thing that I, I wanted to just highlight was um, the way that there's, there is an individual in the crowd mm. who is a very fleeting thing, but I thought it was really interesting, who seems to misread the crowd mm. and he shouts some anti-Semitic thing. Mm. Um, which I won't say, but he shouts it, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the crowd look at him and turn on him and kill him, yeah. beat him to death. Um, which character was that? He, he was just—I don't just, think he was a particular no. character. He just happened to be in the crowd, yeah. and he was joining in with with the yeah, you know. Mm. And then he says it, and and obviously he's misread yeah. what that crowd is about. He's completely misunderstood, and obviously it's a fatal mistake. Mm. But I thought it was really interesting mm-hmm. how. Um, I don't know if, if Eisenstein is trying to point to a sector of society that, that is likely to do that or that did that, which I guess is probably correct. Probably because the first quote on the screen is 1905 from Lenin and then obviously this film was made in 20 years later in yes. 1925. So presumably there is some... Um, he, he was there and knows some things and has yeah. written based on that. But also... It could just be the point of showing that, like, if you go against the ideology, you get subsumed. <laughs> Which, again, you know, Twitter world is mm. kind of a mm-hmm. obviously a less lethal. There's a, yeah, there's a reason that. I don't have Twitter. Yeah. Never. Um, the um, Miss Reading the Crowd said that the charismatic individual and the ecstasy. So mm. that was the the thing I, I thought was quite interesting was this. There was a character again that I don't think was particularly a big character, but. Um, he seemed to come forward when when there were when it obviously spread from the boat from the ship to Odessa, um, and you had this very kind of charismatic mm-hmm. individual um, speaking and some women speaking in a very charismatic mm-hmm. way as well, um, 
and it seemed like almost ecstatic like the ecstasy of yeah, a kind yeah. of um religious service mm. um which i thought was again really interesting well i think there was definitely the thing is obviously like we know how it ended but at the beginning i'm sure there was a lot of excitement because mm. life was real shit man <laughs> well <laughs> yeah know, they were starving freezing and and yeah the the I don't think that we should just kill the royals, but, you know, they were enjoying a lot of wealth and comfort mm. while their people were starving mm. and cold and dying. Yeah. So I'm sure the idea of a liberator coming would feel like a religious experience almost. To yeah. Be, you you know, if you imagine it's almost like, like you know, having been... You, you feel you've been given the narrative that you are slaves as well to this system. Mm because you are being paid so little and you're being treated so badly to then have what feels like a, yeah, a godly experience of yeah. someone coming in to save you. Obviously it was treated like as people because ultimately it's about people taking power back. Yeah. But it would, I can imagine it would feel sort of like a miracle. Yeah. Of course there is a religious character in there, mm. the orthodox um, yeah. uh, religious leader yeah. who, who tries to invoke the cross, yeah. um, which obviously... Um, he comes to a bit of a sticky end because mm, I think yeah, it's about the people and seizing mm. that power as the people, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He's so, a he's yeah. a symbol of of oppression, really. Yeah, because it's all part of like mm. part and parcel is the of oppression, I suppose, is is state and church. Yeah, it's often they yeah. are. Yeah, because it's this idea that you're anointed by God, isn't it, yeah. to become a um, a king or queen? That's right. Um, and the other thing I thought was interesting was when the I, f- I forget his name, um, the character with the big moustache that gets shot mm-hmm. um, begins with V. Sorry, I can't remember oh, his God. name. Oh, oh, um, yeah. But he is treated like it's almost like he's lying in state. Mm. They bring his body back and they have a tent where mm. they put him in the yeah. tent and the people all queue up to mm-hmm. watch, to mm-hmm. walk past him mm-hmm. and bless him. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just like a leader lying in state, which I thought well, was really interesting. Yeah, like with the whole wasn't wasn't Lenin like Lenin, leading yeah. to some sort of like what did they do to? Well, they embalmed him. Yeah. I, I believe that he's still. I think he he's is, still yeah, there. Yeah. 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 So um, so yeah, it was it was very much I think pointing to that. Mm. So that there's some of the things that I I got from it. Mm-hmm. So I kind of enjoyed it. I must admit, I didn't expect yeah, to enjoy it. But yeah, I did. but it's actually... I think for a really old film, it's actually quite modern. And I don't think people would expect that. No. But it is. I think it is the fact that he's thinking in a way that um, influenced modern filmmaking. Yeah. Like I said, with the montage and the editing. Because he does a lot of cross-cutting and things like that, mm-hmm. which just wasn't really done before. I thought um, some of the photography... I mean, obviously, it's... Mm. It's black and white. It's old yeah. film. It it obviously it's very striking. So some of it is like when the um, mm-hmm. you have scenes of the port, <coughs> excuse me, and the um, the ships coming in, the masts yeah. and the funnels, mm-hmm. and it's it it's sort of silhouetted against mm. the the sky. It just looks um, so cold yeah. and and um, and in unhuman. Yeah, I yeah. would say it's like mm. what what have we become you know mm. we've got all these metal things and they're mm. black and they're ugly and they're cold. monolithic yeah. and they're cold and it's sort of yeah we'll have to find this other one i think you'll like it. it's a bit mm. shorter there's one that he filmed a lot of the church sort of you know, because their churches are quite beautiful a lot Ornate, of them, yeah. and wonderful yeah. so that's interesting because obviously he has an opinion on religion which yeah. you can see yes in Potemkin. but we'll, we'll have a little look at that just out of interest um i'll link as much as I can of his films, just yeah. to look at because, um, yeah, I think it's really interesting. The one modern film that I think very directly copies um, Eisenstein. So I think a lot of them are influenced because montage is just it's Eisenstein's thing that obviously was just very good and cross cutting and all of these you know cutting away to other parts of you know disparate images to create metaphors. A lot of films do that, but one film that I think really obviously is doing it, and I just feel like they must know they were doing it. It can't be an accident through osmosis. Yeah. It must be a purposeful choice. Is um, 
and it's a film that I think is actually pretty crap, but the beginning scene, <laughs> um, you know, Lucy. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that. Yeah. Yeah, do you remember? With the animals yeah. being attacked. Yeah, so she's um, she's like a, a prey, isn't she? Yeah. She's obviously being caught, and then you've mm. got, and they cut, when they cut to, away from her, they cut to a deer, and when they cut away to the people chasing her, they cut to lions, and yeah. then when, and then they cut to a mouse and cheese and her being lured right. in and things like that and yeah. I think that's really directly very Eisenstein yeah. especially when you look at um, Strike and you look okay. at yeah. the cow being butchered and then you cut to the yeah. men running in mm. battle using the animals like that especially mm. it's weird though because like you never it's such an odd use of that tool in a film it, because it, it doesn't, just doesn't fit it doesn't seem to sit well does it I no. remember watching it at the time um, just and, a bit weird couldn't quite get a handle on that and that's that's the film that has that really annoying idea that we only use 10 percent of our brain yeah, and it's which is you know it's um, it's not how brains work <coughs> it's not how brains work but anyway let's not get into no. that but like obviously they've they've shown a um i don't know i feel like maybe maybe there was a script there that was good right yeah and then hollywood got hold of it maybe. and they went that's well we can't be doing mm. with that because mm. there's like this fleeting idea of like creativity and difference and then it sort of dies. Yeah, it's not terrible all the way through, but no. uh, it it hey, we're talking about a completely different film no, now. I know. Let's let's um let's talk about that. But it's time. how it's linked. Yeah. But yeah, I see I can see that. Yeah. But um yeah, I guess there's a lot of a lot of examples now you see that yeah. you think, oh I've seen and the other thing I was gonna say is the score. So I don't know if the score that I was listening to is was the original. I think it is. It seemed absolutely appropriate. Um but I thought how much that reminded me of some modern films. Mm. Particularly um that one uh, which is a bit of a favourite of mine which is so much of a favourite I can't remember what it's called. No, but not Unsimilar to that, the the later one by um, um, oh. the same director. No, what's it called? Um, where he Matthew McConaughey's in it. Oh, what when the Earth is he's just rubbish. Yeah, it's going. Um, oh, Interstellar. Interstellar. Yeah, that's a really intense score, actually. You know, most modern films. Yeah. Don't have such an intensity. You yeah, don't notice the score, right. but in Interstellar, it's like it's almost disturbing it's how loud it gets at some point and just intrusive. so intrusive in a way that yeah, um, silent film yeah. would use it in that way. Yeah, because yeah, you've got nothing else That's to right. rely on. But like you said, I think you made a point earlier as well of um, before we turned the cameras on that you don't know why. They weren't because it's nineteen twenty five, and he's obviously still using mm. text on screen mm. instead of actually synchronizing audio and yeah. recording it. Um, because you said like there was technology, it just took a long time to pick up. Yeah, it just it just seemed to me as I was watching it, it just occurred to me um, that the the technology of having talkies, as they mm. called them, um, seems to me like the sort of thing that you would come up with almost immediately having movies yeah so initially there was technology to record voice mm. and then there was technology to record moving pictures mm. and it seems to me like if i'd invented moving pictures straight away i would have thought oh i'm gonna put some sound yeah. to this and yeah it took years mm -hmm. really for it to become mm -hmm. a thing i think what i was thinking is that um there was an art form in what it was as well and I was thinking, you know, like you said about the bowl of soup thing. Mm. I think that really does have an impact with the score and just words on a screen that say killed for a bowl of soup. And do you think maybe just someone saying that would have as deep an impact as cutting to a screen that just says killed for a bowl of mm. soup? Like there's something so mm. almost inno in innocuous. I don't know. Like what's the word? Like it's just ambivalent and... And doesn't, but it but it, it but it's means, very unstated, yeah. I suppose, yeah. literally and metaphorically, yeah. in that it's not actually stated; it's just written. Yeah. Um, but 
Yeah, but in a way, that's you could say that about any yeah. any art form. When you get developments in that art form, then mm. then you do lose something. You lose something as soon as photography came along. Yeah. You lost something from artists sitting and just painting Realistic. a real scene, you know. Mm. Um, but that didn't stop photography coming. So it's, it's, I don't think it's kind of purposefully thought through like that I, I can't see any filmmakers going well i'm not going to do that because we're going to lose something in our art form no i think I, I, obviously I, I mean <clears throat> technology innovators will create those things but i think it took a while for people to accept and integrate it like production houses didn't immediately all pick it up and go, we're all going to do that when it was lucrative yeah they all did because it did well with one film and they didn't want to be left behind but they were all kind of like well but I don't know if that's maybe, yeah, or if it's less art form and more, you know, how when a new thing comes out, like yeah. with the clutch or like the choke in a car and people were like, oh, well, we'll always have the choke. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> God, yeah, it's a very niche thing that, um, so this is a conversation we've had um, yeah. when I'm driving. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when you had a choke in a car, which meant you had to pull out the choke, um, which actually allowed more petrol to get into the the mixture um so when the car was cold you had to pull the choke out to get more mixture in and then gradually you pushed it in whereas eventually it became a um an automatic choke but in the early days there was a lot of kick against it same for washing machines i remember my mum said i'd never have an automatic washing machine why do i need that i've got a twin tub um yeah. and so yeah there is a there is a take-up problem and i suppose in in cinema houses they wouldn't necessarily have um, the, the equipment yeah. and, and the technology to, to display those films. But yeah, it just, um, it just, just struck me as, mm. as kind of a... I don't know the answer to it. It just was a question. Yeah, really. I think people used to... I think it was thought that it was a bit of a gimmick. Yeah. Um, like 3D. But actually... Yeah. No, I just... I don't know about 3D. Well, 3D seems to be dying, doesn't it? Um, it dies and then it comes back and it dies. Yeah. And it comes back. I hope it just dies personally i'm fed up of it it doesn't quite work what i would suggest is that 3d is like maybe a bit of a middle ground before you just get vr Mm, maybe (laughs) like you either have like films as we have or we have vr maybe i think the big problem is the glasses It's, it's and it just makes it look a little bit Janky. Not quite right. Yeah. What I think the glasses are more good for, and what they've taught us, is that you could do, um, you could do subtitles for the heart, like people mm. that are deaf, and any that deaf people could go to any screening then because they could be there, but you just put the glasses on. And yes. That's something. Someone make that and start selling it because there's a huge deaf Surely. population. Surely. You could make a lot of money. Yes. Imagine. Imagine. Right. Are we done then? Yeah, I think so. I think we've covered the crown. Yeah. So we've done Dialectics. Mm-hmm. We've done Battleship uh, Pachumpkin. Mm. Or Potemkin. Uh, I think... We are English, so I think I'll just call it Potemkin. <laughs> and uh, we've, we've touched on a few other subjects as well. So thank you very much. I enjoyed that. And um, we'll, uh, we'll see you again. Yeah. Don't forget to... Oh, yeah. So if you're on YouTube, then I'm going to put loads of boxes on and you should need to pick one to watch... Um, because and subscribe you, yeah if you want us subscribe if you want us to grow and go on the journey with us then watch more things and then you know what you should do next is you should press the subscribe button <laughs> because then you can keep watching it and you should also press the bell icon because then it will tell you every time but obviously there video. is an opposing view which says you don't need to do that at all because dialectics means you have to accept that some people won't want to yeah, do that and that's fine but you won't um, then we won't keep making the stuff and it'll <laughs> fail. So <laughs> join in. Cool. Bye. You have to wait. Bye. Bye. Subscribe. Subscribe.